Hey everyone, welcome back to Main Deck. Uh, of course, I'm Dan here, and today we have a very, very cool video for you. Um, I am super excited to welcome Eric Julongar from Equinox in France. Uh, Eric is here to tell us about a an upcoming TCG called Altered. Uh, Eric, how are you doing today? Hi, uh, nice to meet you, Dan, by the way, after we've met in Gen Con. Um, I'm just coming back from the US, so still a little jet lag, but back to work, so it's fine. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can understand that. There's a, quite a bit of time difference. It was really fun to try and um, get this scheduled <laughs> with our two different schedules, but um, I'm so happy that you were able to take the time uh, to talk to people today. And yeah, as you mentioned, um, we were super honored to be invited to view Altered for the first time um, at Gen Con 2023 this year, and it it just kind of it blew us away. Uh, we were super, super excited about the game, wanted to record a video on the spot with you, but decided there just wasn't enough time to like do the game justice. Um, so I was super happy that you were uh, willing to come on. And um, I think today's video is really just going to be explaining uh, what Equinox is, what Altered is, and what some of the uh, just super, super um, compelling ideas you guys have for kind of revolutionizing the TCG industry, uh, not to oversell it, but it feels, it kind of feels that way. Um, so if you don't mind, would you like to start us off just by talking about, uh, Equinox and, and who you are? Yeah, yeah, of course. No worries. Um, obviously we're French, uh, based in Paris. Uh, we are a company that was funded three years ago by someone named, uh, Regis Bonse. That name should ring a bell to some of you gamers because he's, uh, the former founder and owner of a publisher company named Libelud. And Libelud, among famous games, uh, made uh, Dixit, Mysterium, Dice Forge, or Seasons, which uh, in particular Seasons and Dice Forge are made by Regis himself. The two others were published by him, and he worked on them, but wasn't the uh, author. And uh, in 2020, he decided to sell his company to Asmode which uh, he know, he he has known those guys for many years, so they are kind of uh, very close friends. And um, he sold them his company. Then he decided to do something else, and this was his project. And this is uh, how he went to build Equinox. And uh, why did he do that? It's because he, well, let's be honest, he was bored. He didn't want to to go on vacation or something, so he went straight to the to work uh, right after he sold his first company. And uh, he's also a former TCG player, TCG player from the former uh, 1993 era, like the very beginnings, the Alpha editions and so on. And he reminded something that back in time we've lost since. It was that in those times when we started playing TCGs, we were very, very excited because we didn't know much about TCGs. And also because when we used to open boosters, we didn't know what to expect into them at all. And this is an idea that remained in his mind as a sense of nostalgia, that he wanted to do something around. And that's how we started to build uh, the ideas around this main idea. And since then, it's been three years. Uh, we are now 30 people in the company, all permanent contracts, and we are looking forward to release the game next year. And you were one of the very first to ever uh, uh, discovers the game uh, on a B2B level, let's say, because we've had some testing for two years now with some, a lot of people in France and some in the US, but this is the first and official time we, we shown something and this is going to go forward um, uh, more and more uh, up to the February of, uh, up to February of next year. And maybe I'm going to, to give more details about that later. Yeah, definitely. I hope yeah, so. Um, it was it was extremely uh, just it was extremely interesting to hear, I guess, about the whole the the company um, and especially uh, Regis just getting you know bored and <laughs> deciding to conquer a new uh, a new arena. Um, we've heard, I think, from a number of TCGs in the past, you know, about that that idea of kind of like rekindling that that nostalgia that's sort of been lost in the the age of the internet now, um, where you know the the whole set is spoiled a month before it comes out and everybody um, knows what the best decks are before they even have cards in their hands. Um, and uh, so it's, I think that's, that's almost like a, a Holy grail, I guess, for a lot of TCG designers to, to try and achieve that again, because it really is, there's something special about that kind of excitement and, and rekindling that. 
Um, and uh, just as far as like, I, you know, we'll talk about, I think, what the company is doing to try and create that excitement. But um, I think before we kind of get into all that exciting stuff, we need to really discuss um, what just kind of what the basic gameplay of Altered is like. Um, and, uh, you know, if you'd like to kind of lead us on there, I'd, I'm happy to uh, let you talk some more. Yes, for sure. Um, the first thing I can say is that when we started thinking about the game, we knew if we wanted to have a chance to make a difference and to have a chance to survive into this industry, which is very tough. I mean, it's been 30 years that there has been quite to no evolution uh, after Pokemon and, and Magic uh, arrived. And all of the other projects died, I mean, uh, after a couple of years at most. And uh, only Flesh and Blood is a newcomer since uh, three or four years now, and they are doing pretty well. So also they gave us some um, some indications on how to go into this market and have a chance. And what we thought is that if we don't make a difference, a very strong difference, yes, we could have a good game, sell a couple of boxes, but what happens next is people forget about small differences. I mean, they need to stick to something very, very new. So we wanted to invent a lot of stuff on many, in many different ways uh, as much as we could but we had to start somewhere and this somewhere is a game principle so because of Dixit and Mysterium and Libelut's history and Regis history we already knew that we wanted to make a game that would look like what we used to do in the past which means we want to be coherent with uh sorry I'm just my whatsapp is pinging removed so we wanted to be coherent with the previous brands, and it was Regis' uh, um, art of making things anyway. So we are very inspired by Miyazaki, very inspired by key concepts as onirism, poetry, or optimism as well. Optimism is key in what we do. It's also a motto in the company. The so way we are built as a, as a band of human here is not like any other companies that I might know. We are not in a pyramidal state. We walk in the lean management state where no one is really the big boss here. And, and because of that, we came up with a game today that is all about something different than you're used to. And this different is adventure. The fact that usually in TCGs, in most games, you fight to destroy your opponent or you fight to, um, to, to just battle your creatures, one with each other on a, on a strength and defense, a statistic approach is something we wanted to get rid of and we've built up a different system where instead of uh, battling to do to death your opponent instead you're going to uh, compete with your opponent but more likely in the olympic games way so you're going to set sails out of uh, the main gates of the game and uh, the main city which is part of the lore which name is Gascarfa and you as uh, one of the champion of the six factions available to you in the game you're going to play as a duo a duo of a human being and uh, also a creature coming from the imaginary world and both of you are going to discover the world around us a world that that is unknown to us in this game because of some events that occurred before and you're willing to rediscover this world prior to your opponent so in fact you're racing each other to to see who can uh, discover first the new area and the area is shown with a map that is in between both of you players this is kind of a neutral aspect board gameish aspect of the game where you have five cards in between both of you and each of you starts on the side of the of the map and you have to be the first one to have both your heroes meet anywhere to win and this is what altered is all about and your creators instead of strength and defense they have abilities to move into biomes and we have three different types of biomes into our game forestry aquatic and mountainous and that's how you will you will battle with your opponent in some way yeah, what that was, um, you know, the the striking thing when we first played the game because you're absolutely right. You know, most games that come out, um, it, it, they might even directly use magics like power, toughness, stats. But if they don't, they're still often comparing power stats in some way. And and I think you said in the presentation, uh, no bloodshed was an idea in this game, and uh, that's how I've been telling people about it too. Um, and I just I love that idea. It's so inclusive. Um, 
even even uh, Lorcana here is using like a challenging system with power stats, um, whereas uh, this game completely avoids any of that. So there, there's you're, there's some cards that I know like will get rid of your opponent's um, explorers in in their in in the expedition zone, um, but that's usually you know it's it's not uh, we're not killing <laughs> anything right we're not we're not just like stabbing people or anything um, which is. Uh, just, it's really refreshing, I think. And, and I, I hope that, you know, if this catches on, that's part of the reason we, we get, um, because I think the industry needs a lot of, uh, it needs to be more welcoming to people who have different sensibilities than just, I want to go attack things. <laughs> I want to go fight, you know? Um, so I, I love to see that quite a bit. Um, and I can say too, from my perspective, just playing the game, um, the, uh, we, we couldn't, we actually had to, my, my partner, Jordan, who was with me at the demo, uh, right before we were going to leave, he said, do we have time to play another? Like we got to sit down and I think we were playing up to the, the very, the very last minutes before your next group, uh, started, uh, jumping in. Yeah, it was just, um, it was a lot of fun. We wanted to experience the different factions. All the, all the viewers here will see, um, in the background here, we have uh, faction artwork from the various, um, the various characters that, uh, were in the demo decks we were playing with, um. So this is a this is a leader based game as well, where you're going to have you know a, a leader with their companion at the head of your deck. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric. I think you said there are three leaders in each faction in set one. Is that right? You're correct. Yes, for uh, in the core set, in the first set we are ever going to release, you're going to find three different uh, duos of heroes for each faction. So eighteen duos in total. Yes. And then when people are deck building, this is a this is a mono faction game. We're not mixing them in this case. That's right. Yeah, that's it. That's a mono faction game where you choose your leader among the three available to your faction in this version of the game. And you choose your cards from your faction. But also there is a trick to it that you're probably going to be willing to, to talk about now or later. So I just leave it to you if you want to to go to that yet or not. I think we'll save that for just a little bit. There's a whole, there's kind of a whole setup that I think goes into that whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, there, that means, you know, out of the box right away, people are going to, everyone's doing the math in their head. Okay. So like 18 different kind of like archetypes before you start breaking it down into, um, the individual card choice. Um, and, but with this game, you know, I'll, I'll just tease it a little. There's going to be sort of a, an infinite almost amount of, you know, variation in how you're going to be building your decks here too, which is going to be very exciting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, other, other than that, I think just some of the basics that people need to understand, it's a sort of, it's a resource building game. You're going to start the game by putting three resources down from your hand out of the cards in your hand. And, um, it's very, uh, very popular thing right now. Just any card in your hand can be a resource, nice, flexible, interesting risk reward decision-making, you know, do I want to save this card? I can't play for later when it's going to be really clutch or, um, do I want to have more options in the early turns by putting this as a resource and saving my lower cost things? Um, that's always really fun. Uh, and then um, I think one of the big things, so we, we're going to have a number of people on our channel who are interested in Star Wars Unlimited. Um, and I, this is just, I mean, I, I can't stop laughing about this, but the fact that uh, both these games were being developed in tandem and just coincidentally, they both use the back and forth action system. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. I think you said you talked to FFG for the first yeah, time. Yeah, um, yeah, indeed. Just, just to say before I go too much into the details, um, Asmode is a partner. They are our exclusive partner. So, and they also own shares of the company, but they do not own the company. So we are Asmodee, but we are not Asmodee. Okay, just to say, Regis Bonse is the owner and sole uh, decider, leader on, 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 on the company uh, topics. Um, yes, when it comes to the game development, uh, that really struck us because we didn't play Star Wars Unlimited until Gen Con. So uh, we didn't know how it worked. And when we played it and they started to explain the first rules of the game, we were like, okay, <laughs> okay. I think I know that. <laughs> and yes, yes. The fact is we, I think those are mainstream ideas nowadays. Some game principles that works really well, uh, offering you chances to decide right from the start of the game. Uh, strategically speaking, if you want to keep these cards or, or, or not, and if you see it as in mana, then maybe you're not never going to have to play it again, a chance to play it again. And also, uh, it's a system that allows you to start with more than one mana. So it speed up 
the part of the game where you want to go into more choices, more possibilities, rather than being locked with very small choices where you have to play some things that cost one, then some things that cost two, and so on. So starting with three manas uh, is really good thing, we believe. We love it. I mean, Star Wars Unlimited is two mana. This is three for us, but this is good for them as well. For us, it makes sense that you really go into the mid-game, late-game of a game where you're really interested by the decision-making rather than just, you know, okay, one red mana, one goblin, one red mana, another goblin, and so on, you know, like in some other games. Yeah. It, um, so, yes. It, that reminds me so much, just that, that decision-making process that went into deciding to start with multiple resources. Um, I, I think I brought this up in, in some, maybe some of our podcasts before, but um, I remember, you know, back, I think it was, uh, well, whatever, six, six, eight years ago, whenever Overwatch first came out, the popular um, video game, shooter game, I remember reading this design article that just was like, it stuck with me since then, where they said they played the game forever, where there were ammo pickups in the game, where you had to refill your ammo as you went on. Um, and eventually they just were talking to people and, and everyone's like, yeah, it's just not fun to have to go find ammo when you run out. And they said, well, if it's not fun, why is it in the game? And they ended up pulling it out. And I love that. It's just, it's such a similar concept of just, um, you know, if the beginning stages of the game are the least interesting and the least fun part of the game, it makes sense to go, well, how can we, how can we make that part just as fun as the rest of the game? Um, also the back and forth system, I mean, uh. It's nothing we invented. I mean, uh, Hearthstone had this for a long time and some of the games. It just works well. I mean, it, it avoids you just uh, sitting there and waiting for 10 minutes that your opponent resolves everything he has to do. No, here you do something, then he does something, then you do something, then he or she does something, etc., etc. And I believe it's cool that you're always... Um, on your toe to play something you're not just uh, you know afk like going away for 10 minutes that he finishes comboing and then you come back okay you're done what's the state <laughs> of the board it's boring we don't want that no it's not modern yeah and and i i just i get into that headspace so much i love that you know if you're thinking multiple actions ahead okay do i need to do this now or do i need to do this now what's my opponent going to do how are they going to respond um in the demos, the uh, um, one of the factions was playing a hero. My opponent, Jordan, was playing a hero that allowed them to delay their action. Um, so if it's, instead of taking the first action, they said, actually, he said, actually, Dan, you get to take the first action. And every time that happened, I was like, I hate this. Like now I, now I have to decide one side of the board to commit to. That's, um, that's kind of one of the big things. We didn't really talk about that too much. But, you know, you said the idea was you're trying to get your hero and the companion to meet in the middle. Um, so, again, just like coincidentally similar to star wars and limited there are two go ahead yeah but, but here the, the fun thing here is that unlike in star wars where from what i've played it seems like you want to be first player and you battle for this you know you have the uh, first player token yep. in our game most of the time at the moment it seems like you want to be the second player because you want to be able to react to what your opponent decisions are most of the time and, and this kind of game design isn't something we came up with like as in intense. It just was an observation of how the game was played. And so we started to understand to understanding that because it's better to be second player in our game, so we have created mechanics according to that. But it wasn't at first intense. It's just um, how it went. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's huge too. I, I want to point out, I, I guess one of the big takeaways I want from this is that um, I think people will go into this and, you know, if they're just, if they're people who are part of our audience who just like to pay attention to lots of, lots of TCGs, they'll do the exact same thing we did, which is they, they will see the game and go, oh, wow, this, this is crazy, similar to Star Wars Unlimited. But it's, it's, I think when you play it, you feel it's, it's not, I mean, I, I think the two exist in very different headspaces, despite them having a number of, of sort of like surface level similarities. Um, that, that whole thing is, is part of it. When, when he read the card and said he gets to take a, the second turn instead, I was like, I don't, that doesn't seem like a huge advantage until he started doing it to me. And I thought there's like no way I can win on these, on, uh, either of these sides because he just keeps reacting to everything I do perfectly. Um, and that was, yeah, it was just really cool. It was a fun headspace to explore and why we couldn't stop playing it either. And I, and I, the only thing I regret is that I couldn't get in a third game with the other two factions. Um, 
Yeah, so it's a cool game, very exciting, but I, and I think that's hopefully kind of enough information people understand. You know, it is a it is a competitive game, but it is not a bloodshed based game. Um, has very stunning artwork, like you said, Miyazaki inspired that you can see here. Um, it uses that action system back and forth, uh, basic resource building. It'll be the kind of stuff that I think a lot of our TCG players will will understand, but have not quite seen in this mix um exactly that altered has um with that extremely unique the you know the board game ish component as you said of trying to travel on this map and we'll have i'll have posted already on this pictures that so people have gotten a, at least to take a look at kind of what a board looks like um so with that said you know I, I think it's a very unique game but eric why don't you tell us about some of the some of the most unique aspects especially related to sort of how, how the game's being marketed and you know, you remember that's the reason why we had you play first and then discover what's next after. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, you flowed through it very well, so I'd love to repeat that for our audience here. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, the thing is, I don't know, um, probably at this part of the video, you will have shown some cards and people might have noticed that the playing cards that you have shown have uh, maybe already a QR code shown or uh, or at least a space for a QR code. In any way, the cards in our game will all come up with a QR code at the bottom right hand corner of the card, which means uh, we have a digital application coming along that you will be able to access via the QR code or just uh, via uh, Google Play or Apple Store, etc. And you can also access it via your computer. So you will have access from a laptop or from a PC as you wish or from your smartphone. And what you do is when you scan a card and you have your application where you have created your account, so you create an account. When you scan a card, there are two different scenarios. If the card is not owned, it's purely new, like you open the booster, then you can scan it uh, with your photo uh, apparatus. Apparat, that's how we say it. Yes. And once it's scanned, you can register it into your collection. But you can also do that via a mass scanning option, which allows you to first shoot as many QR code as you wish in a couple of seconds. It's very quick. Like for a booster, it's like two, two to three seconds. And then once you're done with scanning QR codes, uh, you can decide then to register them. So we, we wanted to address an issue, which is usually that when you go with a QR code, you scan it. Then you click on the links and it goes you it, it takes you somewhere else on on the website it's very slow if you have to do that uh, card per card so here we have a solution that does it very quickly and then once you're uh, done uh, scanning your cards you have them into your collection into your collection you can do a lot of things you can deck build you can register your deck to any available tournaments uh, which allow you to register deck so no more you know paper and pencil uh, for the usual other kind of tournaments. Now, you don't need that anymore because also the LGS, the competitive um, organizer, will be able to help that tournament from the application itself. So everybody is built, you know, everything is built within. And then because you have deck built, you have registered, you can also find your rankings, your history as a player, who you've played against, uh, in the last couple of years, if you've won, if you've lost, what deck you had, what deck they had, what's your personal statistics with uh, the count you've played most, who you played against the most, who you lost against the most, etc. We can do multiple things here. And once you've done that, uh, also because of your QR code and everything is built within, comes the marketplace. And the marketplace is the way we have, we believe we are going to change uh, part of how the business is made on the TCG industry right now is instead of having you go to any uh, second uh, any second marketplace in Europe, in the US, you know, all of them. I, I'm not going to quote names here, but uh, eBay has bought one of them very recently. <laughs> um, uh, here it's different because you can do that into the app. So because you do it into the app, and you own your card digitally. By the way, every QR code is unique. So even if two cards are the same, you have one QR code for each. So when you do that, you scan your card and you want to sell it. You put it on the marketplace, you set up a price, and then someone everywhere in the world buys it. So it's a worldwide marketplace. It's instant. It's in euro or dollar for the start. So it's in real money. There is no crypto money. Uh, it's not NFT. It's uh, just uh, just a digital ownership of the cards on our database. 
And when you when you are done selling a card, you get the money back to your account and you can you can cash it in if you want. Otherwise, if you bought a card from someone and you want to play with it, of course, obviously, you've bought just the digital ownership and maybe the guy is from Japan and you're in the US. So usually you would have to wait a couple of weeks or days that the card arrives by mail. Uh, so it could be a fake card, could be a counterfeit, could be a, a damaged card, could be not the right card you order, could be not the shape or the state or, you know, the grading you were expecting, etc. Not the language you were expecting, many potential issues plus the waiting time, plus it might be lost. So here you have no issue of this kind anymore, not at all. Why? Because when you buy a car, digitally speaking, to someone, he doesn't have to send it to you. And how come? It's because we come up with a service proposal as an extra, which is named Print and Demand. And Print and Demand is a feature that allows you anytime from your app to order any card, any number of cards from your collection to be printed from the factory and delivered at your home after a while. So it means the closest factory we have available, and we are working with Carta Mundi on this, which is a worldwide card provider, will get your order, print your cards from the factory, brand new, and mail them to you at home. So instead of, I mean, dealing with someone unknown, you always deal, you always deal with the same company. Your cards are brand new. And you can choose the language you wish. So it doesn't matter if the guy who sold you the card is Japanese. You play in Spanish or in English. You just print it in whatever language you want. And you get them brand new. So this means that these people, he doesn't need to send you the cards. So it's easy for him to sell a card. He can still keep playing with his cards. Okay, no issue. You can also play with the cards, know that you have printed it. The only difference is that only you can play with it competitively you will be the only one able to register this card in a competitive tournament because you own it, okay? Other than that, you can, he can and you can print as many cards as you wish as long as you have them into your portfolio. You can share them with your friend, with your brother, with your sister. You can, uh, I don't know, reprint them if you've lost them, if someone has stolen them from you. It doesn't matter really. What matters is the digital ownership. Of the we had um it, when when I told our group about this, uh, they were really keen on this idea. They wanted to print ten copies of their favorite deck. They go to a tournament, and after every round, they wanted to dramatically throw the deck in the trash can and then pull out the same deck and play it again. <laughs> it's not very um, mm, mm, concerned about the environment, right? Let's say, but <laughs> yes, it, it was it was you could do it. Hopefully, a joke that they were <laughs> making, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that's obviously that's a that when we heard that that whole thing is just kind of uh, mind blowing. I had the question right away of whether or not NFTs are involved. Obviously, I think one of the big things to keep in mind um, is that you know with this all being on your servers, there's going to be some. Uh, I think people are going to have security concerns, um, and I think just in general, there's going to be all sorts of. This is going to be such a new process. Um, that people are going to, there's going to be hurdles, right? There's going to be just little bumps along the road that um, another thing people will point out is uh, when they are doing a box opening video, they're going to have to figure out how to either like keep the QR codes covered up or delay a live stream um, so that people can't scan their cards and, and steal the ownership of them. Um, there's going to be a number of little bumps, but I mean, I think any you know, revolutionary process like this is going to come with those. Um, did you want to address any of them for the audience before they start furiously commenting down below? Oh, yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, I mean, uh, it's fine. Um, obviously, first time ever you come to our game and if you haven't been concealed, no one has given you any good advice or, or you haven't heard anything, yes. I mean, you, you, you could find yourself with someone who is not really kind to you and is next to you with his phone and he might try to steal QR codes from your cards once you open a booster in front of them. Yes, that might. Unfortunately, we cannot really prevent that besides thinking that most people have uh, are good people instead of being bad people. But also, if it happens to you, I mean, this is the kind of thing you remember all of your life and you're never going to make the same, same mistake ever again. So, yes, if you buy your booster, 
just pay attention. I mean, it's not hard to see someone with a telephone and coming to you, you know, with his phone just like this. It's it's easy to avoid that. Also, you can open them at home if you want. So I would say might happen, hopefully not too much, and people will be nice to each other to, to warn each other. Um, also, when it comes to security, I mean, the application itself is as secured as any gaming application you might know of, like if we, which is doing the same kind of thing, like Clash Royale or World of Warcraft. Every, everything happens into the app and we have the same standards uh, as the rest of the industry. So um, I don't know if, it's, if it answers your concerns also for the influencers, because I know this question arised. Uh, uh, yes, you influencers, if you do booster opening, you, you should maybe have some delay if you want to do it live stream. Uh, might be a good idea because otherwise someone could 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 scan your card uh, via your live stream. But other than that, if you're a YouTuber, you can post your video later, so you're protected by the fact you you don't do it live. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I agree, and and I think that really shows the company's just commitment to that optimism uh, policy. That idea that you know we just expect that people it, who get into this game will generally uh, be good natured. Um, I I think. One thing that I would just say to anyone who's who's concerned about that is that like a lot of these issues really mirror things that already happen in other TCGs. Someone can also just snatch your rare card from you and run um, in any other TCG. Uh, they can, you know, you can have your whole entire collection stolen uh, physically, just the same as you know. There's a the possibility of something like that happening digitally as well, um, and. I, I think it's it's kind of just it's not an avoidable thing. It's it's not something you can we can just say 100 percent. You know, there's no way anybody can can do bad things. <laughs> I work um, I work in in research uh, in my full time job. And it's the same thing I have to tell everybody, like we do everything we can to protect your privacy. But um, bad actors are going to do bad things um, and we can't avoid that. And on the plus side, in this case, we, uh, you know, well, it's possible maybe for someone to find a way to digitally hack the servers or something. Um, it means that you you don't have to be as protective of your physical cards now as you were before. You can, you know, it's 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 kind of like a trade off there, I guess, of some kind as well. Yes, yes. I mean, you just last thing you said about someone can hack your account. Yes, that, that's true at a personal level. I mean, that's true for your bank account. That's true for anything in your life. So you can have probably bigger issues than getting your altered account <laughs> hacked. Yeah. Hopefully for you. Uh, or I know, and hopefully, I don't know. And uh, also, um, I mean, the in case we would have a big crash, for example, on our side of things. I mean, sometimes even World of Warcraft is down or, or Fortnite is down and it happens to even the biggest. Uh, well, we will set up standards on how to roll back um previous saves if needed and so on so there is always a possibility uh unless this is uh, the end of the world of course but <laughs> but usually we i mean this is standard now so we know what we have to do and we will do it well so i'm not really concerned about this i'm more concerned about uh unfortunate people that would i don't know give their phone away to someone unlocked and they could access this kind of stuff might happen so, but because you can track everything, you know, it's online and you can also, we can also offer people maybe at some point um, a log, you know, a log system that would allow them to see all of their transactions, everything that happened from their phone, from their application. So I don't know, let's say someone did something while you had your phone on the table and unlocked and, and you check later, you can see that something happened, you know. And maybe you remember who and etc. But it's up to you to secure yourself also. So we can't. I mean, we will be responsible on our part of things, and it's up to you to to pay attention to your part of things. Yep. And it's just like it's it's up to you to keep your binder safe, keep your deck box safe. It's it's not a different thing, really. It's the same kind of deal. Also, one last thing that's interesting to say here because I didn't mention it is if you scan a card which is already owned by someone, mm. you know. It will just state it. I mean, uh, it's not like you can steal the ownership from someone just by scanning his card. So it will just give you an access to the card itself and show you the marketplace and if it's available, the price and so on. But 
you will know that this card in, uh, is owned and basically you can't you can't register it anymore so it's really it's all about sealed product i mean first time it comes out first scan is the most important then it's up to he to he or she owns it definitely so sealed product um let's let's talk a little bit about what comes inside of a box here so i mean like just so people are clear again this is a this is a tcg i think some people are gonna um when we say some of this other stuff they're gonna think of some other types of games this is a this is a tcg uh selling in booster packs and starter decks um and what's what what do you expect to see in a booster pack will and we'll have relevant photos here as necessary um we will have you will find certain cards in the booster pack you will find so we have um i will explain the rarity system after but uh, we have commons rare and an extra layer which is let's say uh let's call it u for the moment for, for the moment the letter u and uh so you can find rather uh, whether uh three rares or two rares and a u plus common cards and for the 13th slot you will find uh, whether a token three times out of four just a token that you need to play with some archetypes into the game or you will find an extra type of cards which we just rebranded today as a foiler instead of a joker which is a term you you used in uh, in gen con and a foiler is what it means which means this is a card which has a qr code in it you will find three types of foilers uh, one is common one is rare one is you and uh, once you scan it with your app it will uh, register into your collection a right to foil for one of these variety of cards which means that once on your app you can use one of those folder and uh, and use it forever it's a one-time use to decide which card of the according rarity you want to foil. So let's say you have a rare, you use a foiler on it, this rare will be foilable forever from now on from your collection, which means that when you print it on demand, you can then choose if you want to print it no foil or foiled. And this is how we will come up with a foiling system because you will not find foils into uh, the base boosters because of technical issues uh, we had to make things differently and the spoilers uh, will all also be available into the organized play part of our project and also if you don't like foils or you have too many of them whatever you can still sell them over into the marketplace so it's also a product you can trade and I, I think I just, I didn't make this really clear earlier either, but the thing that really excites me about that marketplace is you get your foilers, you get your cards. If you want to sell anything you have in your collection, um, this is going to be the easiest game in the world to make those transactions because you just, with a couple of button presses, you pop it on and then and it sells <laughs> at some point. Um, it's, it's, I don't have to ship anything. I don't have to. I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to go on like find, join the Facebook group for the marketplace and make a post and put in the date and time and hopes. You know, I, I, I for, for me that was like wow, that's like mind altering. And then the fact that I can take these foilers and and just sell them individually. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm going to foil my cards, but you know, other people can do that, which is I think that's just super cool. And also, just because we do it this way. We can also, I mean, we will also allow you not to trade cards, but to lend cards, to rent cards, to, you know, you can to give away cards if you want, because you might be willing to give away cards to your friends or, or your family. So you will have multiple options. You pick up the ones that suits you. And, uh, and, and I mean, that's pretty easy to use. And also at this time, if you want to trade cards, physically speaking, you know, just by physically trading cards, you can also do it. It's just... You do the physical part of it your way, I mean, with someone, and you just uh, switch the digital ownership via your phones with someone else. So it's up to you to use it whatever way you want. And I can imagine there will be some people who maybe do still want those like traditional marketplaces so that they can just immediately swap the cards rather than having to go and pay to order them in. Whereas I think there'll be a lot of people who just go, you know, whatever it's what, what I think you don't have this locked in stone, right? But what does it cost? Uh, what, what are you envisioning it costs to order cards um, to be printed for you? Um, we do not yet have the final numbers and because it's a complicated discussion with card family, but we know the... Mm, the basics let's say so we 
want this type of printing on demand not to go above a dollar for a card. It should be at the very most, if you want to print one and only card, a dollar. And the price will be lowered and lowered the more cards you order at the same time, plus the delivery fees, of course, depending on where you live, plus the awaiting time, depending on where you live. And, and this is something that, regarding what you said just before, is very interesting because the way the system is going to work for everyone might seem some new way of doing things, like, for example, a store owner, like a account retailer, might be willing to collect all of the available cards into the game, mostly the common and the rares, uh, so that when he owns them, he can print and demand all of them all together, like per hundred, if he wants. So he has stocks, and he can then sell those cards as a commodity to anyone who is not willing to uh, wait for the delivery time uh, from an online order. Uh, you know, you could buy the physical card from your uh, closest store, and maybe you will even pay it less because the store will have benefited from a volume price uh, rather than if you would have bought it uh, by yourself uh, uh, one by one by one. You know, so all of that is just going to see a new way of doing business. Some of the people are going to invest into the physical cards business just because it makes them available to the masses when they need them and they are not willing to wait. Some people are going to wait at home. You know, it's like Uber. Some they, they Uber eat, some they eat at a restaurant. It's up to you if you want to go out or if you want to stay at home. I, I think this is going to, you know, from the LGS perspective, this is going to take um, some, you're, you're going to have to maybe approach things differently uh, than you do in other TCGs as far as, you know, like where you, how, how you're going to be making money from selling single cards. It's certainly going to be possible for them to just you know, get digital cards scanned in and sell the codes on the marketplace just like anyone else or sell them locally to people. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting idea to just, you know, have that collection of cards. So if if you own the di three digital copies of this one card, but you, the tournaments today, you don't, you don't want to go um, order them in, you'll be able to pick up some physical ones uh, that way. And then you're, and then you're good to go. Um, so I, I think that's, it's going to be interesting to see how people adapt. Now, from an LGS perspective, uh, what's what's a big incentive that players are going to have since cards are since cards are you know just kind of tokens more or less, and the digital ownership is the important thing. What's the incentive people have to keep purchasing booster boxes for this game, Eric? And I'm I'm teeing you up a little bit here. Well, if you want to be able to buy the cards on the marketplace, there need to be offers on the marketplace. So it's just a question of. Uh, of uh, offer and supply, as always. I mean, uh, the less cards available on the marketplace, the higher the prices, the more incentived you are to buy boosters because the value of your booster can be very high on the marketplace. And the more cards have been bought as boosters, uh, the less value they have over the marketplace. So it's, uh, it's a story of offer and demand, I mean, uh, as always. And like for any other game, in fact, like in Magic, I mean, you go on any, uh, marketplace around. If too many boosters have been opened, the value of the cards themselves is very low. If there is scarcity, then the value goes high, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the the big thing here is that you know you're you're pushing that these these digital cards are required for competitive play. Um, so that's obviously going to be in the favor of LGS's running events. They are they're going to want to run organized play events to encourage people then to own the digital cards. I mean, a nice thing is that people can just, you know, you you can just give out as a store owner, you could just give out a bunch of cards. You could have a bunch of uh, cards that not the digital owned, you know, not the digital tokens of the cards, but just the physical cards and say, hey, do you want to learn how to play this game? Just go ahead and grab these. You just need to, you, you need to pick up your own digital cards to play in our tournaments, but you're welcome to learn with these for free or for whatever low cost you want to charge. Um, I think that's yes. really cool. And also from the LGS standpoint, I mean, it's, I believe, we believe, but it has to be proven that it simplifies your uh, supply um, uh, maintenance, I mean, uh, logistic, mm. because you you don't need to store thousands of, ten of thousands of cards, you can just order those you need when you need them, and you see what you need compared to the market trends, 
and and also because it's online uh, selling for most of the cards you don't need to package them you know to put them into a box to go to the mail you don't need to do after sales service etc most of the time it's easy so it's going to simplify a lot of of the burden for uh, for the store owners and the online sellers that that are willing to, to 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 chase on this game yeah absolutely so what what are people going to be chasing in these booster packs then what's the what's kind of the big hit what's the u <laughs> what's the u the u is a concept we thought a lot before going after it the u is is for unique cards which means that instead of having um, uh, in magic it's named midi cards or i don't know in flesh and blood uh, fable cards or something like this very expensive cards in our games they are named unique cards because they are unique i mean uh, uh, when you get one um it's a one of a kind that no one else over the globe will ever have doesn't mean and just to say it the card itself is just uh, from a family it's issued from a family so I need to, uh, to to roll back to uh, the concept itself. In our game, every single card into the game exists as a common card. Okay, there is no like the common families and the uncommon family and so on, and they are different. No, to us, let's say we go with 200 cards with the first expansion, with the first set, you will have 200 commons. Okay, also because the system works like this. Every single card that exists as a common card also exists as two rare examples of the same card. Which means, let's say you have ship, uh, a card named ship, which is a common card. Then you have two ships uh, as rare cards. Why two? It's because it's a mono faction game. And the first common card might be from the green faction, let's say the Muna faction, the green faction then one of the two will always be from the same faction, which means green, okay? And the other rare card will be available into another faction. So every single card has two rare versions because one of them is always available for another faction and, and designed to fit into this other faction based on the very principle of the card itself. So let's say a card would generate birds tokens uh, in the green faction. If it goes into the uh, blue faction, it will maybe generate instead uh, soldier tokens, you know, just so that the flavor remains and, and it makes sense in terms of tech building. Once we've said so, then comes the unique card. And the unique card is also based on the same common cards, you know, and the unique cards, uh, powers and statistics, as for the rare cards, is improved. Okay, there is a common card, the rare card is, is improved compared to the common version, slightly improved. And then the unique card is also improved, but in a random way. It's algorithmically generated from all the outs, from all the possible outs uh, we offer in this game. So it can be statistics, mana cost, or text, rules of text, etc. And you mix that up, and it makes a billion or billions of possibilities for every single card to be generated differently. And once you find one into a pack, which by the way is one every eight boosters, like for the medics in Magic, the one you have is purely unique. But you can find several examples of the same burst version as unique ones. Just they look similar, visually speaking, but just some stats will differ, you know, like the legendary items in Diablo, for example, if, if people are familiar with that. So that's the system. And we did it this way for several reasons. The first one is, as I stated in, in my opening, we wanted to bring back something really cool to the table, which is the sense of excitement when you open boosters. Okay, And now when you open a booster and you find a, you find a unicorn, you, you don't know what it is. I mean, you, you have no way. It's not like it's net decked. You, you, you haven't found the list of all possible stuff available in the booster online and you know everything. No, this one is purely unique, pure, purely for you. So what you do is you just pick it up, you check it, and you have to think by yourself or ask the market, what do I have? Is it good? Is it exciting? Can I build the deck of my dreams with it? Uh, am I going to play in a tournament with it? Etc. Etc. And also unicorns are cool because we are limited. We are limiting them also into the play, so to prevent any uh, imbalance. So you can only at the moment play three of them into a constructed deck, and they are cool because they are rare. You don't play. A lot of them, but when you play them, you have a chance to surprise your opponent. And same, so does he. 
I mean, when you go into a tournament or you play against your friend and he comes to you a new deck, he's going at some point probably to play a unique card, but you don't know what it is. And he doesn't know what it's in your deck. And, and maybe it's going to open new gates to new gameplay and to new combos. You don't know. So we believe it's cool and we wanted to try. So we hope the community is going to, to like it as well. Yeah, it's it's an extremely yeah, it's exciting extremely concept. Um, the other thing you mentioned is that the rares, you have the rares, which are slightly, you know, slightly better than commons as well. Um, and one of the first things I thought of was, especially when I heard the uniques, what's going to stop a player from just, you know, going whaling, spending tons of money, getting all the uniques and rares and just building the decks with the most powerful cards? Yeah, as I said, uh, at the moment, we are limiting the usage of uh, unique cards into a deck to three. And by the way, the decks for the moment as well are 40 cards. Might be definitive number, might not be. And uh, the rare ones are also limited at the moment at 10 examples. So with what we have, you should build three uniques, 10 rares, and 27 common cards uh, into a standard deck at the moment, which means you will have to play with everything we have to offer. So choose carefully. Yes, I and I, I love that. I, I think that's so interesting. Just when I started thinking about the deck building, aspect having if you i don't know what your number is exactly you said if you had 200 commons or 200 cards for example there's 200 common versions and then that means there's 400 rare versions of these cards and then there's literally just i mean an uncountable number of unique versions of these cards um i i don't even know i've never heard of a game coming out and saying we have you know well more than 600 different cards in our first set um, to the point where you can't even comprehend how many. I, I don't know how, I can't wait to see, I want this to come out and I want to see what people start to decide the the metagame is or whatever, because that's just an, it's an absurd number of possible combinations. Yeah, it's an absurd number, but at the same time, it's only three of them. And you know by the deck building principles that usually you have cards that go along what you're already doing with your deck. So I, I don't believe it's going, to, it's going to be an absolute nightmare to follow uh, uh, on the other side. No, it won't be. It will just be something that comes and empower a play style, an archetype, and you will build up around this Unix card maybe because you feel like there is a potential for something, a combo, and you want to build it up. And you're going potentially to make new decks that are unexpected to the table as well. Yeah. Um, those uniques are one thing, you know, I think we talked about too, during the, during the meeting was that, um, so the cards show up in the app when they're, is it when they're, is it when they're scanned or is it when they're added to the marketplace that people can like start to look at them? How does that work? Um, what we want to do is we want you to be able to find any printed cards that are, that has ever been printed. Would it be on the marketplace or not? It's just that let's say you, you filter in the, into the marketplace because you're looking for a very specific unique and you want to know if it's available, if it's been uh, um, drafted in a booster, then you put your filters and the system will tell you maybe, yes, this card exists, but it's owned by uh, Dan and uh, it's not on the marketplace. And then if Dan allows you to, to offer him uh, and to make him an offer, then the system will tell you, do you want to make an offer to Dan? Or uh, the button will be available. Otherwise, if Dan decided not to be uh, burdened by uh, offers and proposals, he can just, you know, uh, um, set off his uh, his application not to allow that. Yeah. So it's up to the it's up to you to decide if you want your collection to be uh, to, to 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 be something people can ask you about or not, but but you will find all of the existing printed cards. So also, if the unique cards you're looking after has never been printed, but you will see it because the system will tell you, sorry, I don't have this card. That's yeah, that's super exciting. That sounds super super cool um, to be able to like try and hunt down those cards and and get offers from people if you're willing, if you want to, on your cards. Someone comes, you know, I'll spend a thousand dollars for that. Well, okay, yeah, I don't need a thousand dollar card in my deck. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, Why not? Yep. Um, I, I know I'm about to lose you here. We're running up on our time here, so uh, I, I apologize for that. What I'm going to say is that uh, if um, our audience, I can do I can do five more if you want. Perfect. Thank you so much because I, I do want you to pitch um, a little bit about kind of where people are going to start to be able to see altered. Um, I just want to say that if 
Uh, if our audience has questions, which I'm sure people will about this game because of just how new everything is, go ahead in the comments, uh, leave leave any questions you have. If I can't directly answer them, I will bring them to the team and I will get answers for you guys so that people can know exactly what's going on. This is a, there's just a lot of new concepts here. So um, happy. Please ask questions uh, before you necessarily make your judgments on anything so we can make sure they get answered. Um, this game either will or won't be the thing for you. For me, I heard all of this and I was... I was just super excited. This sounds this sounds so fun. Um, can you tell people, Eric, where uh, where they're going to start to be able to see altered in the future? Um, I know there's a there there are pictures showing up that have the word Kickstarter on them as well. So we got a, a little bit to talk about there. So go ahead. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, so what we want to do is we've been at Gen Con, we've met with you guys. We are going to do the same at Essen in Germany in uh, early October. And from then, we are willing to organize a roadshow, which should be available in as many stores as we can supply and as we can organize as well, because we need to send demo players there. So we would like to do that in the US, in Canada as well, and, uh, and in Europe. Um, we are still in the process of um, planning it, seeing how we can logistically do it uh, if we need to work with a partner and we are discussing with some some people to do that and we've asked Mode. So what we want to do is we want to have as many of you people be able to play Altered, Discover Altered prior to February 24, because in February 24, we will release a Kickstarter, which will be the key point of uh, what we are doing at the moment. And we want to offer you a very nice Kickstarter, but also it's easier for us if you know already about the game and if you like it, and if you want to follow us on the social media, as well, for all of this, all of you that will attend the road shows, we have a lot of gifts. We have some of uh, the six. We have six amazing promo cards that we have shown you. You have yours at home. I hope you haven't been stolen yet. They, they're still mine. No worries. <laughs> so you will have uh, crazy promo cards. Uh, plus, uh, we will offer you a chance to register your account prior to anyone else on our website. Which means, if you do so, you will get free boosters that will be registered on your account at release. And uh, and uh, and of course the game is exciting. So you're, I mean, uh, we already came to the US. To be honest, it was in last October, November. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And we went to Minneapolis for this to the uh, FFJ Gaming Center. Previously, FFJ Gaming Center, which is I don't remember the exact name nowadays. Gaming Center. Game maybe? Center. Something like that. Game Center. Yes, 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 a big store. So some of you had the chance here to to test the game, but we want more of you to have this chance. So I can't state the name of the shops we are going to do that with, or or how many shops, or which part of the country. You have a big country, and uh, it's very expensive to do all of America. <laughs> but hopefully, we find, I mean, center points so that even if it's uh, uh, not close to you, but not that far, you you can attend. Yeah, and I will be doing my best to get down to those roadshows when you come back up uh, up north here where I am. So I can't wait for that. Um, Eric, did you have any last bits to tell people here? I mean, it's just um, I'm looking forward to have you people and uh, listen to this video and maybe read the comments and furthermore to see the assets we have shared with Dan and some others so you can have a sneak peek about what we come up with. Um, also the arts, if you love them, if you don't like them, the rules, if you have questions, do not hesitate. Also, we have a community Discord, uh, which the link is on our social media, so you can already find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, altered underscore TCG usually, or altered TCG. You will find a link tree with all of them, and uh, I mean, we are really looking forward to it. We have tested the game so much in France and in the US in the last two years. We have a team of pro players, team pro magic players, I have to say, from France, testing the game every week here. So they just help us, uh, you know, make everything right. And uh, this is, uh, how do you say that? La dernière ligne droite, the, the last uh, the last straight line up to the finish line. I don't know in English how you say that. But... Sure, sure. That's, um, yeah, I, I, it's not coming to me right now either, but you're, yeah, you're heading to the finish line right now. So... But well, I mean, for us, going at Gen Con was amazing because this is the first time we had real feedbacks, you know, like not business feedbacks from Asmodee or people that had something or into into it. That's that's cool. But we wanted to get the real audience to see the game and to give its opinion. 
So we had really a, work, a welcoming uh, uh, moment with you, a charming moment, and, and just being there with you today proves it, I believe, and I'm hoping to talk to you guys more, and, and that's it. I mean, Dan, thank you for this. This is cool. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much again, Eric. And yeah, we are really looking forward to Altered here. So um, like Eric mentioned, make sure to hit up all the socials. They're going to be linked down in the description. You can head there, join the Discord, follow them on Twitter, do all that kind of stuff. Um, and keep up on Altered. And if you stay tuned here to Main Deck, of course, you are going to be catching, I promise you, you're going to be catching more Altered content here as well. We are just super pumped about it. Um, thank you once again, Eric, for tuning in. And thank you guys all for watching. Leave your comments down below. Let us know what you think. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for watching another Main Deck video. You can support Main Deck by shopping at tcgplayer.com using our affiliate link. Check the description of the video for details. Main Deck is sponsored by JDub Sports Cards and Gaming. Visit jwwcards.com and by our amazing patrons. Get exclusive content and other cool perks on the Main Deck Patreon. And uh, hey, while you're here, I bet you'd like one of these videos. Go ahead, click one. I know you're gonna love it.